Hi, I'm Jim McCann. I'm an outdoor writer and photographer. I live in Fairbanks, Alaska. I've been here most of my 50 years in Alaska. I've been writing and photographing for magazines, books, uh, advertisers, and photo agents for about 35 years. kid from the Northeast, uh, and that's where I learned uh, the ways of the rough grouse and fell in love with them, and I've been uh, hunting them and studying them ever since I uh, took my first grouse at 12 years of age. I took the oath to serve my country in 69. After my military service, I made the big move and came to Alaska, and here I am. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, upland hunting in Alaska, coincidentally, that's also the name of my acclaimed book, Upland Hunting in Alaska. Check it out. I don't have a lot of time on this video to go into all of the biology and habitat and whatnot of the individual birds, but we'll gloss over that. Uh, but I would direct you to the Alaska Department of Fish and Games uh, website. they got a lot of good information there. And, uh, and then I'm going to tell you probably more than once that you need to get out and, and do some scouting way before the season begins and uh, become the student and remain the student. You know, I've hunted upland birds here in Alaska uh, all the way from uh, uh, Cold Bay on the southernmost tip of the Alaska Peninsula all the way up into the Arctic and a whole lot of places in between. And I've learned a few things along the way. Uh, let's jump right in now and talk about uh, the birds. Uh, grouse, we have rough grouse, sharp-tailed grouse, and spruce grouse. Ptarmigan, you have willow ptarmigan, rock ptarmigan, and white-tailed ptarmigan. <clears throat> Rough grouse, my favorite. Um, in the interior, uh, where they are naturally found, uh, you'll find them uh, mostly on uh, south-facing slopes of uh, uh, aspen and birch forest uh, with a good brushy understory. And here they like uh, uh, high bush cranberries. That's a favorite fall-time food. Actually, same for the spruce grouse. Uh, they're not always just in spruce bogs and spruce forest. Uh, they like a lot of the same foods as the rough grouse. Um, Sharp-tailed grouse, uh, they, they're a, uh, a bird of fire. Um, the, uh, they've been here for about 11,000 years, and uh, when the interior of Alaska and parts of the Yukon Territory uh, we're all a, a, a vast grass stepland, but uh, through climate change, uh, the, uh, the, the stepland uh, uh, disappeared and the boreal forest took over, and the sharptails, thankfully, have adapted their ways and, uh, and thrive now in, in interior Alaska and even in uh, south central. They're starting to show up there. People have seen sharptail grouse in downtown Anchorage. Same for rough grouse. Incidentally, rough grouse didn't naturally appear in Anchorage or the South Central area or Kenai. They had great uh, habitat, but uh, the mountain ranges uh, separated them and uh, didn't allow them to disperse there. Um, but Alaska Department of Fish and Game in the 80s uh, uh, trapped a bunch of uh, rough grouse up in the interior, out of my covers, and uh, shipped them down to the Matsu and Kenai and Boy, the Matsu, they're really doing really well all over South Central. Uh, they're not doing too well in Kenai, probably because of the uh, wet and cold spring temperatures and uh, bad nesting conditions and really bad for chick survival. Um, when you're hunting rough grouse, back to rough grouse again, um, you know, you have to know the habitat. Uh, and uh, dogless hunters... Uh, they're at sort of a disadvantage, but uh, in one way. Um, but dogless hunters are, are real hunters. Uh, you are continually honing your, your hunting edge. Whereas a guy like me following a pointing dog is, I may still have some hunting edge, but it's the dogs that, uh, that enter the habitat and find the birds and point them out for me. <clears throat> but a, a dogless hunter working through rough grouse habitat it should work a zigzag pattern. 
and stop often. Rough grouse have hair triggers. And uh, if you stop, uh, they, will, they won't be able to handle it. Uh, sometimes, though, they let you walk past, but mostly those hair triggers go off and, and they flush wild. Um, let me say this, and I may repeat myself on this, but it's good information. Uh, when you're hunting rough grouse, or any bird, any upland bird, when the flush is imminent, when for whatever reason you know that there's a bird here or a covey of birds and the flush is imminent, although carrying your bird gun at port arms is a good idea uh, when the flush is not imminent, when you're just carrying it through the woods and uh, out on the tundra and in the grasslands, uh, when the flush is imminent, what I would suggest strongly is that you go from port arms down to a more ready position. From port arms, the bird flushes, the bird is rising rapidly, gaining speed, and perhaps uh, flying at an angle. What you're having to do it from port arms is to come all the way down with the muzzles, all the way through the bird, below the bird, and then try and race to come back up and catch up to the bird. You're behind the power curve already. Rather, carry the gun at a in a ready position. The buttstock is is lightly tucked under your shoulder. Uh, your left hand is extended down onto the fore end or even their fingers out on the barrels and, uh, and the muzzles are down more at horizontal. So that way when the bird comes up you watch, you get hard focus on the front edge of that bird and bring your gun up to the bird and then through the bird. It's the English, the British instructors uh, uh, a long time ago taught me uh, it's butt, belly, beak, bang. You bring the gun up, the barrels go through the bird, butt, belly, beak, bang. When we shoot any upland bird, we're not shooting the bird where it was. We're not even shooting the bird where it is. We're shooting at the bird where it's going to be. It's an act of faith. It doesn't make sense when you consider that the shot column is coming down that barrel at uh, 800 miles per hour and the bird is maybe at 25 miles per hour once it's up to speed. But the problem comes in is that it takes a while for the brain to tell the arm, to tell the hand, to tell the fingers, to pull the trigger, the firing pin to fall, the explosion to occur. And if you're not getting out in front of a bird, you're going to shoot behind that bird. You go out and uh, practice on the, on the trap and skeet range, which I strongly advise. Uh, if you're missing, uh, an instructor would probably say, I think you're missing behind. That's where most of our misses are. Why don't you try and miss out front this time? That doesn't sound like it makes sense either, but when you get out front of that bird the next time, you smoke it. So, butt, belly, beak, bang. Um, also, when you're hunting rough grouse, uh, as, as you gain knowledge in this, take note of where those rough grouse flush to, what sort of cover. And after a while you'll be able to pick out that cover in a certain habitat and you'll kind of know before the flush. If there's a bird here and it comes up, he's probably going to go to that copse of spruce trees or what have you. And there you can place your feet properly and uh, be ready for a good move, mount, shoot. Spruce grouse, you know, they're, they're ubiquitous. Uh, they're all over the state, all over, <clears throat> and we all see them uh, out picking up grit along the dirt roadways. Uh, incidentally, grit, uh, all the birds uh, pick up grit to, uh, to get down into their gizzard to, to break up hard foods and aid in their digestion. Uh, inter interestingly, uh, spruce grouse like dark grit and rough grouse like light colored grit, but that's just an interesting uh, side uh, note for some, maybe you can win something at uh, at, tri at a trivia game, but it uh, doesn't really mean anything. You're not going to hunt up grit by color. Um, but spruce grouse, uh, they're often maligned uh, and, and called uh, ditch chickens, uh, well, spruce hens instead of spruce grouse, uh, fool hens, because they sit. Uh, well, all these uh, birds will, will try and sit as long as they can, uh, ptarmigan included, uh, rough grouse too, a little less than all the rest of the birds, but Sharp tails. Sharp tails will, will hold, uh, they'll lay as flat out in a field of grass as, uh, 
they look like they're uh, they're not any higher than a bison patty. I've come up on them and watched them, and they, it looks like somebody's run them over. They lay very flat. They're all camoed up. But to know this about all of our birds, and and especially when we're talking about the spruce grouse, because when you hear a complaint, it's that well they're stupid. They let me get real close, and then when they flush, they just jumped up on a tree branch. Well, know this, for any upland bird, all day long, all year long, for their short lives, uh, they're, they're playing around with uh, mammals, ground mammals, ground predators that are trying to come out there and, uh, and eat them. And they deal with them. How do they deal with them? Uh, they wait as long as they can, hoping their camouflage will work, or they jump up on a tree branch. Know this, that a bird, uh, an upland bird, realizes that their number one predator comes from above, raptors. To fly is to die, definitely. Especially when we talk about ptarmigan. Can you imagine uh, a, a lone ptarmigan or a small covey of ptarmigan out on the snow? They rely heavily on their camouflage. And, uh, and when a hunter approaches, you know, they'll hold tight as long as they can, but if not, they just run out on you or flush wild, but uh, generally they just run out on you. Uh, to fly is to die because a ptarmigan knows that they won't even hear the wings of a falcon that uh, is their usual predator. Uh, falcons, deer falcons and peregrine falcons come in at over a hundred miles per hour and snatch them right off the uh, tundra or even out of the air. Uh, so to fly is to die. So don't be too hard on the spruce grouse. Uh, spruce grouse aren't all that easy to to hit, not, I mean, if most folks say they are. Well, you know, maybe out in the open and maybe if you're out just hunting for spruce grouse, but you, your mind is focused on, on the grouse and how they, how they fly. Uh, I don't know if I explained that correctly, but the spruce, if you're out hunting rough grouse all day long and uh, they're speed demons, they're rockets that just explode in, in, a, in, a, in a shower of leaves and feathers and off they go. Uh, most rough grouse hunters, especially new ones, uh, complain that, man, I, I didn't really see a, the rough grouse. I mean, it was like gone in a flash. I only saw a little moment of the bird, and he was behind trees, and I never did shoot. Well, if you don't shoot, you're not going to get any grouse. Uh, rookie rough grouse hunters uh, uh, better learn to uh, identify the, the bird on the flush and, and make that move mount quick and get out, get out in front you got to shoot fast. It's an act of faith. So if you're out hunting rough grouse all day long and you've missed a few, all of a sudden a spruce grouse gets up. To me, it's tantamount to a change-up pitch by a baseball pitcher. All of a sudden, you got a slow pitch. Um, and now, you're probably shooting out in front. So sometimes they can be pretty hard to hit. Uh, sometimes they're, they're in really thick rough grouse woods. You don't even know what kind of bird got up. But don't be too hard on the uh, spruce grouse. They're great for uh, n those new to wing shooting. They're absolutely wonderful to train a bird dog. Um, sharp tails. Um, sharp tails are a bird of, uh, of fire. I think I mentioned that already. But we find them in, uh, in places that have been burned, specifically wildfire burn areas and we burn about a million acres every year so we're building habitat for them all the time but uh, wherever uh, ground has been cleared a farm field a crp field um, uh, grassy edges along rights of way power lines and whatnot even along the trans alaska oil pipeline and grassy muskex uh, that's where you can find sharp tails but know this there's a lot of space between them you got to do a lot of walking for sharp tails. Even in a target-rich environment, there there's a lot of space between them. So put on your walking boots. Have a well-broken pair of boots. Uh, something about sharp tails. Um, I mean, I I love them. They're my number two favorite. Uh, they live in beautiful places. Uh, they're harder to hunt because of all that walking and all that space between them. But when they get up, there's oftentimes they're they're in coveys of three, five, eight birds or more. They emit a, a, a soft cackle that's kind of exciting. Uh, they're a beautiful bird, and they taste real good. Um, know this, when a, when, a, when a covey of sharp tails flushes, 
if you've emptied your gun, um, you need to reload your gun right away because there are stragglers oftentimes. Sometimes only one, but I've had them sometimes two or three sharp tails that didn't get the memo. So as soon as those sharp tails get up, load that gun again. Uh, sharp tails, a covey bird, like ptarmigan, uh, will fly off a distance, sometimes way out of distance, uh, miles away, but oftentimes you can watch them and mark them down. Just know that when you get over there to where you mark them down, that they're not necessarily going to be sitting there. Probably not. So you might have to do a, a circular uh, uh, pattern uh, searching for them. But if there's any cover nearby, uh, that's where those birds likely went to. Uh, for the sharp tail, that would be uh, their favorite is, a, is a, a forest nearby or any sort of cover. Uh, spruce trees even, they'll get underneath the spruce boughs. They don't normally, they're an, they're an open country bird. But, uh, uh, but know that they do seek out that forest cover after uh, they've flushed and, and they're alarmed. Uh, they run a lot. Keep that in mind. They run a lot. Sometimes you got to do a flanking mover to get around them. Um, sharp tails also, when you're in the, uh, the grassy fields, sharp tails will like a, a, a rise in the terrain, you know, a, a long mound or something like that, some sort of rise where one or more of them can get up on there and uh, while they're loafing, they're watching for uh, danger to approach. Um, you know, the rest of the covey may be on the other side, but uh, those are good places to look. Uh, sharp tail likes to see what's coming. Um, that's why they're out in the grass. The grass can't be too thick, and it can't really be too thin. Um, they need a certain amount of grass, knee-high grass generally. They like to, they like to hide in that grass. Um, they'll spend time during the day in the wooded areas adjacent to the grass to stay out of the heat or just to hide out from predators. And a lot of times the food source for them is located there. Uh, but they're mostly a, a bird of the grass and uh, they'll be out in the grass, um, especially at night, they've, they've slept there. So early in the morning, you might find them in the grass. The grass. Uh, food for sharp tails in the interior here, it's uh, almost entirely uh, uh, kinnikinick berries and greens with some blueberries. If you find uh, grass and, and some wooded cover and a patch of blueberries, uh, that's a good place for sharp tails too. They love blueberries. But uh, the, the birds I hunt here in the interior uh, truly love kinnikinick berries in the fall. And, uh, and they'll eat grasshoppers when they're available. Grasshoppers are an every other year sort of deal. You have to read up on that. Uh, let's see what else have I said about sharp tails. Um, you know, we, in that I mentioned a lot of space between them. When when the dogs and I hunt sharp tails, my GPS uh, on the dogs uh, usually indicates about 25, uh, maybe even 27 miles they'll cover in search of sharp tails, and it will show that I've done eight or 10 miles. It's a lot for me, and it's a lot for them too. But they're they're tough. They and they fan out. Um, you've got to do a zigzag pattern across these grassy areas uh, to find the birds and put them up. Um, you know, two hunters makes a big di difference, but I, I hunt mostly alone and, and my dogs do all the work really. But they'll get out ahead of me. Um, I had a young one. Unfortunately, he just got hit by a car not too long ago and died. Uh, very sad, but, uh, but young Jake I've had him at times get out to 800 yards. I don't like that, but but generally three, four, five hundred yards, and they and they go back and forth. They'll they'll they're like windshield wipers, uh, going across the grassy uh, sharp tail areas, and then they'll change off and go into the woods because that's hunting objectives for them because they know that they have found sharp tail grouse in those wooded edges. Um, makes it a whole lot easier having those dogs and I have been known to put down three dogs at one time and it doesn't matter really uh, when they're that far out because any good bird dog with good breeding and good training will hold those birds. My dogs uh, will have will always hold those birds until I get there or they die of starvation I swear. 
Uh, we train a lot in the summer and uh, use a lot of training birds. But uh, uh, ptarmigan, same sort of thing. Uh, ptarmigan, uh, you know, most of us hunt willow and rock ptarmigan. Uh, the willow ptarmigan are down lower in the in the scheme of things. Uh, they're in the subalpine valleys. Uh, for willow ptarmigan, they're keyed in on the uh, the willow lined waterways. Whether it's up in these mountain valleys or out on the Arctic tundra, uh, where there's a, a waterway and willows along, that's where you find the tarmig the willow ptarmigan. Uh, rock ptarmigan are a little higher up, on the more barren slopes. Um, unlike the willow ptarmigan that eats willow buds and actually hides in willow thickets as well. The rock ptarmigan is right out in the open for quite a bit of its life and uh, it feeds on uh, dwarf birch. You know, the low-lying dwarf birch buds. Um, they, uh, they will hide right out in the open, uh, seemingly out in the open. They, they, will, they rely on camouflage and they hunker down behind uh, little snow ridges, you know, wind-blown icy snow ridges. They'll get behind it and they might burrow, burrow a little hole down in there and just kind of hunker down, not moving. Uh, because remember, if they're moving around, uh, that falcon is out looking for them and they're, they're keen-eyed. Uh, so they, uh, they don't move around unless they have to. But a rock ptarmigan, interestingly, uh, just because of the inclement conditions and whatnot, has to eat a lot during the day. So it's not just breakfast and dinner. The rock ptarmigan are moving around throughout the day. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they're just putting it, uh, on as much uh, weight as they can or taking in as much calories as they can. They're not putting on weight necessarily, but taking in as many calories as they can. Uh, white-tailed ptarmigan, they're the ones way up. Uh, it takes a long hike to find uh, white-tailed ptarmigan, in the fall at least. Uh, so in the winter, they all sort of co-mingle at times. Um, I've never found all three together, willow, rock, and white tail, but but I guess it's possible, but, uh, but the whitetails will come down and the rock ptarmigan uh, will come down or move up. Uh, and so it, for the willow ptarmigan as well, they will move up into higher uh, willow-lined uh, gullies, uh, waterways. Um, you know, hunting ptarmigan, uh, you hear people complain uh, that they, they hold so tight that I could kill them with a rock. Well, I think you still got to be pretty good with a rock to do that, but, but they do sometimes stand right there and, and hold their ground. They rely upon their camouflage whatever time of year. Uh, remember, to fly is to die. Um, and if they don't hold tight, uh, our, uh, hunters will argue that they jumped up out of shotgun range. Well, that's unfortunate. There's not much you can do about that, except that the second time you find them, those same birds that jumped up wild on you, they might not be as wild that second time. But they're likely to do what I'm going to talk about next, is that, you know, they'll hold for my punting dogs often, generally. But then when I get up there, you know, the orange-clad uh, old guy with lungs heaving and making noise on, uh, on aluminum snowshoes, uh, they run out on me a lot. Uh, you know, I don't take wild shots at them, I just let them calm down. And then I conduct a, a, a sort of flanking maneuver. Generally, because I'm by myself, the dogs are holding in one position and the birds aren't gonna fly back over the dogs. But I, I generally go uphill and I parallel the hillside until I'm above those birds and then I let them settle down. And during that time, I'm planning my assault, my straight in assault. Now, oftentimes, they get up before I've reached a point where I can, uh, where, the, where I'm within gun range, but that's okay. That's the way it is. It's hunting, it's not shooting. But usually I can at least get a, a, a good shot at that last bird in the covey. Now, I don't sky blast, uh, but I, I'll take that last bird and, and hold off taking a second shot. Uh, one bird picking fairly in, in wild country like this is, that's all I need. I'll go hunt them up. It's more excitement for me and the dogs. But um, let me interject this too, that I think we, we kill a lot more birds than we think. But if you shoot at a bird, you should follow up on that bird because a lot of times he's only been hit with one or two shot and uh, he may not be dead at the moment, but he's going to be soon. If you, sh if you see a bird flying off and a, and a leg is, is hanging down, that's a dead bird. 
and watch that bird go down. He may go down uh, way before where the cubby goes down. Uh, that bird is probably going to be dead right there. He's, he took off, you hit him with one or two shots, he's sick. Um, you know, it, it, it's the right thing to do to follow up on those birds and, and try and retrieve them. My dogs always, not always, but often find uh, dead birds shot by others, but uh, um, bird dogs. Now, there can be a lot of argument about this. Now, I'm a bird, I'm a pointing dog guy. I've had Britneys uh, for about, oh, at least 25 years. And uh, I've hunted over English setters and other pointing dogs, but I've also hunted over flushing dogs, so I have some experience with that. Uh, but I like to hunt over a pointing dog, obviously. And let me explain to you why. Uh, again, my dogs fan out, like I mentioned on the sharp tail hunting. Uh, if you can imagine on ptarmigan hunting uh, in the winter or in the early spring, uh, I, I let the dogs down and, and, and they'll be up ahead of me while I'm trying to, you know, get, uh, get, get myself warmed up, you know, and uh, get those muscles moving. But I'm moving slowly up the hill on snowshoes and the dogs are fanning out and they're going like windshield wipers back and forth. They're searching the breeze and they're searching objectives. Objectives, places where they've found birds before. And ptarmigan hunting, that's... Uh, uh, usually, usually a stunted spruce tree uh, or a little copse of spruce trees um, just several of them dot the, the, the uh, landscape and the dogs know that that these rock ptarmigan like to hide near that again they like that vertical security because to fly is to die they're they're worried most of all about those uh, falcons coming in on them um, the uh, the dogs are fanning out and doing all the work, you know, basically anymore. What I do is I carry the shotgun um, and I carry the birds after they've, uh, uh, after I've shot them, after they pointed them, I shot them and they retrieved them. I carry their birds or our birds, yeah, but they, they really do all the work. They cover a lot of area, a broad swath of area uh, while I follow along behind. Like I say, my dogs are trained upright. They come from good breeding, and they will hold those ptarmigan up on those hills uh, in in crazy wind. Uh, they'll hold them until the old man gets there, uh, or they die of starvation. But uh, my dogs are trained not to not to put them up. Now, conversely, uh, you got the flushing dog folks. I mean, those dogs are a lot of fun. Labs, English Springer Spaniels, and the like, uh, little cocker spaniels cool dogs. Now, flushing dogs, they're very efficient, and you get a lot more shots, perhaps, uh, with a flushing dog, but that flushing dog handler has to be within shooting range, uh, gun range, 25 to 35 yards, thereabouts. I wouldn't want to take shots any, anything beyond that. I'm not a 45-yard shot guy. We wound a lot of birds doing that, but the, that handler has to be with that flushing dog, and, uh, and that means you've got to cover a lot of miles the same, going to the same places as that flushing dog. So I think our pointing dogs uh, cover a whole lot more country and find a lot more birds. Now, having said that, uh, in the fall, uh, you know, those willow ptarmigan are hugged up to those uh, big nasty thickets of willow and, and alder and uh, lots of leaves on them then. Now, my, sharp, my pointing dogs, if you can imagine, are... They find the, those birds, they hit that bird scent, and they're on the outside of those thickets, rock solid, pointing into that thicket, saying, oh yeah, there's birds there. Well, guess who has to go in there and flush the birds? Me. Flushing dog? No. They send that dog in and put them up. The flushing dogs, too, there's, there's a lot of chatter. There's a lot of commands given and talk between the hunter and the dog, and I mean, I guess that's okay for some. Everybody's mileage varies, but... Uh, when it comes down to to what I do, I when I get out of the truck and ready to go, put the dogs down. I tell them, "Hunt them up, boys," and off they go. And then they're they're searching back and forth and all around. They're searching all, looking for that scent and looking, going around those objectives and looking. And the only other thing they'll hear from me is after the shot, is dead bird, fetch them up. And then when they come back with the birds, I accept the birds. I pat them on the head, I tell them how wonderful they are, 
I say thank you, and maybe I'll even say something uh, about their beautiful mothers. But then I say, hunt them up, and off they go again. Otherwise, it's quiet. It's just uh, the sound of me walking through the, uh, the woods or the, the grass or out on the tundra. And uh, Well, I, I like my pointing dogs, but be the student. Study up on both of these if you don't know. Visit uh, dog trainers, uh, dog clubs. Watch these dogs work. You know, make a uh, an intelligent decision about which kind of dog you want. What dog suits your way of hunting best? Just because I hunt with a pointing dog doesn't mean you have to. Uh, be the student. Um, you know, get second opinions. You can go to field trials. Uh, in South Central, there's a lot of clubs. There's a few up here in the interior. I think there's one or two in Kenai. Uh, go to those things, uh, talk to people, and then make your decision. But getting a bird dog is a lifetime commitment. Let's jump really into uh, into bird guns real quick. Uh, we don't have much time, but you know, I like nice guns. My gun safe has some very nice guns. I hunt with side by sides, and I've I've reached a point in life where I've treated myself to some really nice guns, but you don't need an expensive gun to hunt upland birds. Not at all. I don't care if you hunt with a Walmart uh, Remington 870 pump. It does not matter. What matters is that that gun fits you and that you shoot it well, okay? Um, it has to fit you. Um, if the stock is too long, you can shorten it. If it's too short, there are things that go on it to make it longer. Um, speaking of double guns, a lot of people hunt with side-by-sides like I do or over-unders. Over-unders are more popular. Um, but double barrels, those barrels have to be regulated properly. And therein lies the difference in the less expensive guns to the expensive guns. There's a lot, there's a lot that goes into right, putting those barrels together properly and soldering them up and making them shoot to point of aim. And maybe some guns on the lower end, just off the rack, maybe they don't do that quite so well. But, uh, but you, can, you can check that out on the range. A um, little bit more about that in a bit, but uh, the gun's gotta fit you. Most important thing of all, um, to make a proper move mountain shoot from the ready position, that buttstock tucked lightly under your right shoulder you bring the gun up, it goes to cheek first, and then it's not far, the, the stock is not far off the shoulder, it's just a little bit of a roll into the stock, tighten and shoot. Move, mount, and shoot. That gun fits you. How do you know if a gun fits you? First up, you have to find out whether you're right or left eye dominant. I'm right-handed and I'm right eye dominant, thankfully. If I were right-handed and left eye dominant, I'd have to shoot left-handed or come up with some gimmick uh, to, uh, to, to make sure that my, my left eye does not take over, because otherwise you're at the wrong angle. I don't know if I can show it on this, but you're, at the, you're looking over the barrels at the wrong, you're gonna miss. When you bring that gun up in a proper mount, uh, and it's to your cheek and shoulder, your eye, your dominant eye, my right eye, needs to be looking right down that rib at that little bead sight on the front. That's the only time I look at the bead. You don't look at it when you're shooting at upland birds. We don't aim bird guns at uh, when we're wing shooting. We point them. We point them because the gun fits and we're going where? Butt, belly, beak, bang, out in front. Smooth mounting of the gun, come up to the bird, go through the bird, get out front of the bird, pull the trigger, and, uh, and go pick up your bird and put it in your, in your game vest. Um, you got to do a lot of practicing. Uh, go out to the clay's range, or or get a uh, uh, a thrower of your own, and throw some uh, throw some some orange birds here and there. Uh, without practice, uh, you're not going to be a good wing shooter. Now, I get often asked, uh, "What's your favorite gun? What's my go-to grouse gun?" Well, if I had to pick just one, if everything disappeared in my safe except for one, I would hope that I always have my Arietta side lock ejector. It's a double barrel side by side. Uh, two triggers. I like two triggers. Um, double guns have two choices of choke. We'll talk about choke in a moment. Um, and I can go the, the, the first trigger, the front trigger, 
is the right barrel and the back trigger is the left barrel, the tighter choke. The right barrel, the first shot, is the open, more open choke and the tighter barrel, the toter, tighter choke is in the left barrel. Um, I have a straight stock. I like those. Uh, the gun fits me well. It's in 16 gauge. A lot of guys don't like 16 gauge. Um, shells are fairly easily found anymore, or you can reload your own. I used to reload 16 gauge, but uh, there are plenty around now. I have now enough to last me for my lifetime. Uh, but I shoot a lot of 20 and 28 gauge also. But I, I like that Arietta. It's choked uh, skeet one, skeet two. 16 gauge shoots a nice one ounce pattern. Incidentally, I use uh, uh, quality hard uh, seven and a half shot for everything. I don't play around with changing shot for this or that, or this pocket's got this or that pocket's got that. Not me. Seven and a half shot, one ounce is all you need. Low velocity, you don't need to have anything that pounds the tar out of you. My Arietta weighs six pounds, three ounces. Bird guns are carried a lot and shot a little. So I like a lot, uh, a light gun. I'm not getting any younger um, and tougher, but uh, uh, 12 gauges are, are fine. They throw the finest patterns, especially with a one ounce load. You don't need heavy loads in a 12 gauge either. They make great bird guns, but they're generally north of seven pounds. And a 12 gauge is the action is rather ponderous in the hands. Now you're going to carry this gun all day long. If you know, if you're guys like me, I. I start in the morning and I end in the evening. Um, if I'm getting close on a, if, uh, on a five bird limit, I, uh, I, I back off and I'll just let birds fly just to prolong my uh, experience out there. Um, but that, that's what I like. Uh, but the gun has to fit you and my 16 Arietta fits me perfectly. Uh, chokes. Uh, you know, I prefer the rather open chokes, like I mentioned, uh, Skeet 1 and Skeet 2. Uh, your mileage may vary. I used to worry about choke a lot, but I, I don't anymore. With today's plastic wads and, and hard shot, uh, choke is almost meaningless. You know, you could probably get by with no choke at all, cylinder. Um, but again, those uh, double guns have a, have a choice of two chokes. And the advantage there, too, is, you know, um, you know, think about it for me as a, using a pointing dog, my dogs are on point. I move in ahead of the dogs. Let's say they're sharp tails. Um, and they've decided to sneak out on the dogs and they're out further than I expect. So they get up wild, further, almost at the edge of gun range. Uh, I'm only going to take one bird at the rise and it's going to be that tailing bird and, but he's already at 35 yards or so, maybe pushing 40. Uh, I'm not going to shoot the open choke at that. I'm going to reach right back to that back trigger and the tighter choke and take that bird there and be satisfied with the one bird and, uh, and enjoy that and, and be done. But So I have a choice of two chokes. Um, if I were hunting with a single barrel shotgun, a pump or autoloader, I'd probably over pointing dogs, at least I'd probably go to improved cylinder. Um, others may try modified. That's okay. Your mileage may vary. Maybe you're taking longer shots. I think the, uh, the flushing dog guys use tighter chokes because they're getting oftentimes a lot of, uh, uh, longer shots. But, uh, but if, the, if the dogs have them and the, and the birds held, I get pretty close shots. Rough grouse hunting, whether you have a dog or not, uh, your shots are going to be close. Uh, they live in thick forest, uh, so when they when they get up, you uh, you're probably you know most uh, birds that uh, are shot at oh I think it's 18 to 21 yards something like that uh, according to statistics. But and in my hunting experience all these decades, that's that's that, that's about it. They're all very close shots for rough grouse. Sharptail can get out there. Ptarmigan can, but uh, Try them out. You won't know how any of these guns operate uh, uh, as far as pattern or even that barrel regulation I mentioned until you go out on the range with a new gun. And uh, for barrel regulation, you can shoot it at a big piece of paper with a bullseye in the middle, small bullseye. You can shoot it just like a rifle off the sandbags and see if it hits the point of aim. But really the best test is to do that same test, only not off the bags, but 
a nice move, mount, and shoot. Move, mount, and shoot. And you'll see not only where the pattern's hitting, but you'll see the quality of the pattern. And you can you can look and see how many, if there's any holes in the pattern. And adjust your choke. Choke can be also adjusted by using different ammunition. You gotta be the student. You don't just buy a gun and go out into the woods. Doesn't work that way, but a lot of people do that. Um, you know, test it out on the range. Uh, let's see. Oh, now I wanted to mention too that dogless hunters, uh, I mentioned a few things about that already, but dogless hunters out hunting for ptarmigan, you know, we, I went over how my dogs are, are like windshield wipers and they're covering all these up and down a valley and they're doing all this work for me. Well, without a dog, you have to cover that ground yourself. You know, uh, hunt, hunt those birds just like you would big game. Uh, their color is at different times different white from the uh, in the winter from from the snow uh, and then there's always that black eye and like i mentioned the rock charm again they, they got to put on a lot of calories so they're out moving around a lot during the day let's talk about equipment before we draw this to a close uh, i wear uh, strap vests mine's made by wing works out of idaho it's heavy duty has lots of pockets uh, i've got a couple of them they've worked well for me for a long time uh, it can, the strap vest can adjust over different uh, thicknesses of clothing. It has deep pouches for plenty of shot shells. I'm out all day long. I don't take that many shots, but uh, uh, has a has a has a nice uh, uh, lined uh, game bag, and inside that game bag is another pouch. And in there, I uh, I keep a uh, a water bladder with a tube that comes out, and I can sip water. Uh, throughout the day. It, uh, it makes it much better for me. I can go farther. You got to be hydrated. Speaking of hydration, before I get off too far into uh, my vest and other things, dogs. My vest has two uh, big bottles, large bottles of water uh, that are in pockets that I carry on each side uh, for the dogs to keep them hydrated because dogs Dogs are putting out a lot of energy, a lot of work. In, this, in the early season, you could kill a dog easily by uh, overhunting him uh, during the hot weather. A dog, they know a lot of stuff, but they don't usually know enough to stop. They're just out there having fun, and I guess they look to us to, uh, to take care of them. So you got to keep the dog hydrated. Rest them often in the shade. Okay? Carry lots of water for the dogs. Carry water for yourself. Uh, there's another pouch on my vest all the way out in the back uh, on the outside of the game bag. In there I carry uh, some survival gear, um, a Bic lighter. Uh, I carry some other lighting material. It's, uh, um, I have a plastic bag with a lunch bag with some uh, cotton balls that are soaked in Vaseline and, uh, and a, a striker uh, starter. I just take my knife and I can start a fire that way uh, any place, any time, in the rain or whatever. Uh, I also have in that pouch a pair of high quality cable cutters. Not wire cutters, they won't work, but cable cutters in case my one of my dogs gets caught in a snare. Now I've had that happen. Uh, not out in the hunting fields, but right around town and uh, uh, around trails where I might uh, be running my dogs and whatnot and where everybody else runs their dogs. But some people uh, just aren't ethical or, or intelligent trappers and they'll put these snares out and some of them even forget them so they're there in the summer too. The season doesn't matter but, but I've had dogs who get caught in, in snares and sometimes your hands are so cold you can't, you can't get down in there and, uh, and work the thing to, to loosen this, this snare that way and the dog is uh, uh, not able to breathe and just fighting for every little breath, he's, he's, he's in big trouble. I'll reach around and get those cable cutters and cut that thing. Um, I also have strapped onto my vest a, uh, a Garmin inReach. Here it is right here. It, uh, it straps on up there. And my family talked me into this. Uh, I go, I hunt alone most all the time, just the way it works out. But, uh, uh, I'm out of cell phone range most of the time, whether I'm photographing uh, way up in the mountains for sheep or something like that, uh, or, or out hunting. 
so the the Garmin Enrich, uh, it has a handy SOS button, so if this old guy gets hurt out there, I can hit that button and some nice folks will come and get me. Um, or, most often, uh, it has texting ability, so where I don't have cell phone range, I can use the satellites. I can text, uh, I'm okay, uh, I'm on my way home, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, it's not cheap. Um, there's a monthly charge, but uh, uh, they could save your life. Um, I'd suggest having a, something like that because, you know, in this country, we're, we're almost always out of cell phone range. Uh, let me again say to you that uh, you have to be the student of all this stuff, of the bird dogs, the bird guns, the birds themselves, the habitat. Uh, the habitat's a little different. The food sources are a little different in, in each area of the state. Um, I'd suggest, uh, you know, you have the advantage now that I didn't have uh, as a young man um, of Google and YouTube. Uh, you have magazines and books. Uh, most importantly, you have Hunt Alaska magazine. And occasionally myself or other writers will write about bird hunting and you can enjoy the adventure and pick up a few tidbits of advice as well. Uh, but you need to be that student. and. Uh, and of, of course, uh, check out the ADF and G's website for valuable information about uh, about these birds. Um, you know, and if you're not a subscriber to Hunt Alaska Magazine now, you ought to get that way pretty quick. But before I go, I'd like to ask a couple of things of you. Well, three things. One, uh, I'd ask you to consider, just consider, limiting your take instead of taking your limit. A limit, a bag limit, is not a goal that we have to reach. Just because you've taken a limit of birds doesn't mean you're a better hunter than, than I am. Um, just, just consider, please, uh, limiting your take and uh, uh, not always having to take your limit. It leaves some more birds for everybody else to hunt and leaves some seed for other birds to, to breed and to uh, make sure that they're always out there for us. Secondly, I'd like you to pick up your your fired shot hulls. They're litter. No other way around it. And uh, actually, a lot of times, uh, my game vest, uh, I almost always have birds, thanks to my dogs, but I also have garbage in there that I've picked up. But I pick up a lot of shotgun hulls that have been left out there by other people. They're unsightly, makes it look bad for us hunters. So that's number two. Third and last, hunter orange. <clears throat> I know a lot of people don't like to wear hunter orange, I do. I wear lots of it. Um, there really is no reason for you not to wear it. Uh, it's the right thing to do. It's a safe thing to do. It makes sense. Uh, you don't have to care. You wear hunter orange by law. It's just the right thing to do. And if for no other reason, I mean, I, think of this. I, I used to be a trooper, and, and I occasionally flew uh, search and rescue missions. And if I'm bombing along in a Cessna 185 looking for you injured down there in the tundra or in the woods, would you rather be laying there wearing some orange clothing and waving an orange hat at me? Or would you rather be laying there all camoed up waving a camo hat? I think you know the answer to that. Consider at least wearing some orange. Um, why do I wear it? Because even though I'm out by myself most of the time, well, because I know other people are out there hunting too, and I want them to see me. I've dodged enough bullets in my life that I don't want to do it anymore, and I certainly don't want to get shot. So I wear as much orange as I can. I make my presence known. Um, if there's somebody else out there all camoed up, I sure don't want to shoot them. And keep in mind, you know, we're out hunting. We're, we have this wide-angle view of the world. But now the dog's are getting birdie, or for some reason a dogless hunter, we now start to narrow our scope our vision, and our world now becomes telephoto. We're taking hard focus, and that bird comes up, and I'm telling you to take hard focus on the front edge of that bird. You don't see anything else. So, Hunter Orange, please wear that. Um, well, that's it for me. Um, I appreciate you uh, watching this video and listening to me uh, gab about it, about this stuff called upland hunting. It's a lot of fun. It's great adventure. Great adventure. We live in a grand place for upland hunting. Beautiful wilderness, lots of wild birds. It doesn't get any better than upland hunting in Alaska. So 
So hunt safe and thanks for watching.